welcome back to the channel. This time we will uh, pretty much jump into it and look at the more technical aspects of what Michele Di Rodi tells us. And I will also address briefly some of the other treatises that survive from this period. I already spoke about the controversy of what exactly are the treatises aiming to do. And that continues to be a question all the way into the 18th century. Well, really the 17th century. By the 18th century, most treatises become much more technical and it is clear that they are products of the shipyards rather than um, great intellectuals. Michele di Rodi does not really fall into the great intellectual uh, category initially. As I said, he started his career as an oarsman. It should be pointed out that in those days, uh, in the 15th century, being an oarsman was a paid freeman's job. It was not, uh, it was not s slaves that drove the galleys. It was only with the increasing numbers of galleys and the uh, size of galleys that slave labor became the norm rather than the exception. That, of course, changed the rowing patterns of galleys, etc. It is an interesting topic, but it is hardly uh, now the time to address it. So returning to Michele di Rodi. Michele di Rodi provided us with data for five ships. It is quite clear that he actually intended to provide exactly the same style of uh, depiction, very systematic approach to describing vessels. He wanted to give detailed data on the galley of Flanders, which was something that I suppose I can describe as the packet service of Venice. Galleys, they were all built by the state uh, rather than by private merchants. They were built in the arsenal. They were built for specific courses that they followed. They were operated also by the state of Venice. And of course, they were transporting the higher end goods, uh, the costly, important mails and passengers. They were not bulk carriers for obvious reasons. Namely that room on a galley is fairly limited. The advantage of the galley, of course, was that it did not depend so much on the weather. It did not depend so much on uh, the winds and therefore could be much more predictable in its uh, services. At what date it will be where. By this stage, navigation had advanced enough that people knew the routes and knew how long it should take them to get from point A to point B. Some of this is described in other parts of this uh, treatise. So the galleys of Flanders and the galleys of uh, Romania, that is to say Rome, which of course is the official and proper name of an empire that nowadays we call Byzantium, Byzantium is an 18th century German scholar's term. It was pure invention specifically to um, demonstrate that we are talking about the medieval rather than the ancient Roman Empire. Of course, the Byzantines themselves did not see themselves that way. They considered to think of themselves as Romans all the way until the fall of the empire. In truth, the Ottomans themselves considered them Romans and considered to call them uh, Romans. That's why southern Bulgaria was known by the Turks as Romelia, Rum, Rome, the land of Rome. So, one of the galleys is the Flanders galley. The other one, practically the same, very slightly smaller than the Flanders galley, was the galley of Rome, that is to say, the one that was trading into Byzantium. When this treatise was written in the 1430s, Byzantium had not fallen. The great city of Constantinople, the tragedy of the world had not yet materialized and Constantinople was still, uh, free Constantinople was still part of the Roman world and the Roman Christian Empire rather than becoming Istanbul. So, in this important period, we see the descriptions. The first part, by far the most detailed description is given for the galley of Flanders. Besides the dimensions, and I will attempt to explain to you and to show you what these dimensions, or some of them, what they stand for. But besides the dimensions, he also illustrated typical midship section, bows and stern, stems and stern posts of the vessels. Uh, what I suppose is really where the whale would have been, 
the maximum beam of the vessel and the shaping of the stern and the bow. I'll show you uh, the sketches that he drew. I hasten to add that quite obviously, as you can see from this uh, illustration, which is rather typical, this is showing the galley of landers on the stocks in the process of being constructed. The first thing that strikes as obvious is that these are not scale drawings. They are merely representational. They're explaining how things look, what they should look like, how they are done, but they are not a scale drawing. He's not giving us a step-by-step -step instruction how to develop every single frame. He's given us offsets. He's not telling us where these offsets come from. It is more, this is how you do this one. It's not, let me explain to you how you design a ship. And this is the pattern that he intended to follow for every single one of the five ships that he discusses. Unfortunately, as I said, the most detailed is the Galley of Landers. Subsequently, probably the second most uh, detailed would be the Galley of Rome. For example, I was telling you about descriptions. If you look at it without reading the text, this almost looks like a strange, bizarre uh, section of the hull, but it is not a section. These, this actually is a plan view of the stern of the vessel. And uh, on the other side, it is showing you the bow of the vessel. Down here, you see a geometrical sketch that is the closest to a uh, proper scale drawing that you know, that you will get here, that is explaining to you how to document the stem and the stern post. He's not necessarily telling you how to design ones. It is giving you these specific, and this is how you can repeat it. Hence, remember my earlier conversation with you on the subject of what the treatises aim. Are they a method of designing ships? Not really. Or are they methods of documenting ships? And for the earlier ones, the bulk of the evidence suggests that this is exactly it. It is documenting of vessels. Then here is the clue that you have to an actual sketch of a midship frame. These lines here are about a Venetian foot apart from each other. And at each one of these, for a lack of a better word, I'll call them water lines. They're, he's not thinking of them as water lines. It really is an offset, but at these offsets, he gives the half breadth of the frame here. So you can repeat this frame from him, but you can't really design another vessel in this way. And this probably is the most useful from ship modeler's point of view. However, the treatise is not something that um, inexperienced ship modelers should undertake. This, this is not going to be a step-by-step -step guide to how to do it. So the planking, in the next section, he's already showing you the galley afloat, although not rigged. Again, this was intended to be repeated for every single one of the vessels he discusses, but as I will show you in a moment, the farther he gets into the conversation, the less illustrative he becomes. Then he is describing, here is the yard, the big Latin yard. Here is the mast with the masthead drawn. Again, this is not at all a scale drawing. It is no more than a representative. Then he addresses the boats that accompany the galley, that belong to the galley. I particularly like this illustration, and the larger of the two boats, because of the oar locks. If you look carefully at these oar locks, they are the precursor of the gondolier's oar lock of the Venetian gondola all the way to the present day. But you, we see them as early as the beginning of the 15th century BC. And nothing, again, I repeat, nothing here suggests that this is a new invention. This must have been around for quite a bit before it was written down. Finally, 
he discusses also the rig of the vessel. He speaks of the ropes, he speaks, however, in a way that ship modelers are not going to like, because he gives the weight of the rigging material. He does not tell you how long the material will have to be. He sometimes tells you the circumference of the ropes and how, how much weight of one and a half inch rope do you need for such and such detail of the ship. Yo, enjoy it. The final part of each of his sections is discussing sails, sail making, how many cloths, how wide of a cloth, and how do you put it together, which of course is of some interest. The inevitable anchors are discussed. I have expressed my opinion of grapnel anchors before. They're dearly beloved in the Mediterranean world and the Black Sea. I don't think there is a single village along the Bulgarian coast that does not have at least a couple displayed. And there may be a worse, the only worse form of uh, holding a ship in place that was invented by the humans, I believe, is the stone. And finally, the final uh, illustration is showing the galley completely rigged and at sea, ready to go to sea. This is as good as any time to bring to your attention something that I particularly enjoy in these early images. We see down here the rudder, central stern post hung round the rudder. But what do you see on the sides? Besides the central rudder, the galley has two quarter rudders, the older traditional Mediterranean form of steering. If this is not belt and suspenders sort of approach to steering a ship, I don't know what is. Uh, the truth of the matter is that for the Mediterranean world, the centrally hung rudder was still fairly new. In the north, it, uh, as far as archaeology can tell us, it was invented somewhere in the late 12th century, because the earliest two examples of uh, strong hung rudders are coming from two cogs in Sweden and Denmark, both of which date, the one dates to 1185, the other one to 1189, if only two fallible memory serves me right. But be this as it may, for the Mediterranean world, this is still a new thing and evidently not to be trusted. Or trust, but, you know, have a reserve plan B. You gotta love it. Then, of course, we have Catherine, and we have, of course, the Crabston, or the Crab Capstan, illustrated here. Here is a detailed illustration of the rudders. Do note that these are with transversal tillers, unlike the ancient uh, vessels. The Roman ships and probably the, uh, the late Roman, medieval Roman vessels also had the tillers fore and aft, parallel to the center line of the ship, not transversal. Yes, we do have archaeological evidence. If you're interested, I'll be more than happy to offer you a video on the development of the rudder and the steering mechanism. And then the details of the typical round stern curving rudders characteristic of the Mediterranean world to the present day. The pinto on the rudder, gudgeon on the bottom part of the rudder, and obviously the opposite on the stern post of the vessel. So much. So this is the most detailed of the description. This is the Galley of Flanders. He repeats essentially the same process in drawing, somewhat carelessly if I may say so, the Galley de Rome. And again, we see both the stern hung rudder and the quarter rudders lifted, but present. Just in case things go wrong, you never know. It comes to show just how much he mistrusted these new innovations. It follows exactly the same pattern as for the earlier one. Unfortunately, it is less detailed in the measurements. Either he considered it superfluous, or he didn't know these measurements, or chose to ignore them. Uh, again, the approach to stem, stern post, the sections, but as you can see, he has not written the offsets. Then the bow and the stern of the vessel, and the shear strake. Completed, but not rigged. It was intended to have uh, an illustration of the ship at sea, but in this case he does not produce it. 
for the galley Sotil, he does for the galley Roma. Uh, Rome. I would like to uh, go for because the least addressed in the galleys, unfortunately, happens to be the galley Sotil or the normal light galley, uh, the ones that are used for warfare. It's very disappointing, but that is the part that he addresses the least. Then he addresses two, describes two square rigged vessels. And here is an illustration. This is really where we're going to bring this one to an end. This is your typical cocka. And I will finish this conversation with you this time by addressing the difference between a cog and a cocka. Cocca is a Mediterranean style vessel. This is coca. This would also be known as Karak. <clears throat> By the 16th century, especially the Iberian nations would simply call them naos, ships. But this is what, by the 16th century, northern nations would call Karaks. The cog, on the other hand, is something completely different. And yes, I see the two mixed all that time in secondary literature. Cog is not necessarily a specific shape. Cog is a style of construction. It is a process in which you assemble the bottom, you have a flat carvo bottom, and you have overlapping broad straight sides of the vessel. And there are some other constructional details that this is not the time to discuss. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is the inspiration for most of the Santa Marias out there, or one of the inspirations. So with this, I would like to bring this conversation to an end by pointing out that in the next uh, video of this series, we will address two other treatises and what meager physical remains we have and what meager actual archaeological evidence for the spirit we have. Again, I am addressing only the southern, the Mediterranean tradition of shipbuilding, because it is within this tradition that the Santa Maria and her other vessels were constructed. And after all, this is what really started uh, our conversation about 15th century shipbuilding. In the north, vessels continue to be built in a different way. You still are going to see overlapping clinker planking. Um, we have a fantastic example, perfectly well preserved, coming from uh, Newport in Wales. It was excavated by colleagues and friends of mine uh, earlier in the 2000s. So with this, goodbye, and I hope to see you next time.